Good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Olding, and I'm on the adult reference team here at the library. We thank you all for coming to tonight's presentation on the history of Napa's Chinese community, which will be presented by professional historian Kara Brunzel and sponsored by both the library and local social justice group Rise Up Napa. Tonight, Carol will be using historic photographs, maps, and illustrations to help tell the story of the Chinese people in Napa. She'll talk about the establishment of Chinese communities in Napa, their cultural and economic contributions, the perse persecution they faced, and their persistence. Tonight's event will be about an hour long with about 20 minutes reserved for Q&A. If you have a question during her presentation, please enter them into the chat at any time. The chat, the button is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I'll be sure to collect all those questions and read them off to Kara at the end of her presentation. So this program is in celebration of Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, also known as AAPI Month. It's important to note that this presentation does not cover the history of all communities celebrated during AAPI Month. And that while the content focuses on the history of the Chinese community, in Napa, AAPI Month celebrates all Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Americans. So before we move into Kara's presentation, I'd like to introduce Leslie Liu. Leslie is the founding member of Rise Up Napa, as well as a loyal library patron. Rise Up Napa is a very active local group whose work focuses on taking a stand against injustices and intolerance. So Leslie, I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to you. Thank you so much, Katie. And I wanna thank you uh, everyone for joining us today. And I really wanna thank the library for co-sponsoring this event. Um, you can find us and um, our members and three other co-founders at riseupnapa, one word at gmail.com or find us on Facebook. So the genesis of this talk occurred when I ran into Kara at last month's Stop Asian Hate rally organized by Moms Demand Action. Kara approached me with the idea for this talk and we both saw the nexus um, with how these types of talks could help ameliorate hate crimes against Asians. Literature documents that hate can come from not seeing people uh, victims as people and telling stories humanizes the lived experience of others in a way that we hope breaks down these barriers. We also saw the nexus with uh, May being AAPI month. And so um, thank you, Kara, for really hustling to pu pull together this presentation. Um, but, and also the library with its amazing and robust programming was a natural partner. My lived experience as a Chinese American woman echoes that of many Asian Pacific Islanders. For example, because of restrictive covenants in LA in the 1960s, my family was limited to where we could live. We could not live anywhere we wanted. Uh, I was cornered and insulted as like a four-year-old and beyond through the rest of my life for simply being Chinese. I give explicit instructions to my teenagers as to where they can stop for gas in urban and rural California. Uh, traveling with a Caucasian guy to Canada, I was briefly detained at the Canadian border. I think because they were worried that I was going to try to marry some Canadian guy or somehow become a citizen. Um, all these experiences are unpleasant, but the lived experiences of other Asians recently is just completely intolerable. The organization Stop AAPI Hate documented 6,600 hate incidents from March 2020 to March 2021. That's 18 a day. These incidents include spitting, uh, physical assault, coughing in people's faces, kicking people out of establishments, and verbal assault. The organizers that stop AAPI hate say that these, uh, the numbers are much higher because attacks are often unreported, which I can attest to because I've never reported anything that's ever happened to me. Asian people are pushed and stomped to the ground, some until they are maimed and others until they are dead. So to show how much the daily tragedies of anti-Asian uh, violence have shocked our entire country into action, the Senate, as divided as they are, recently passed the COVID-19 Hate Crime Act by 94 to one vote. So that's 94 to one to ramp up law enforcement efforts to better protect Asian Americans 
uh, and Pacific Islanders from hate crimes. It was Josh Hawley, he's the one. So while my life in Napa has been really super lovely, it's certainly not been without uh, hurtful experiences based on the fact that I'm Chinese. So I'm really so deeply thankful to Kara for bringing this history of the Chinese here in Napa to us today to contribute to the knowledge of the lived experience of, of Asians and Chinese in Napa. There's a lot of hidden knowledge that she generously shares and uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff in her presentation. So a bit about Kara. She's been my friend in the activist community for several years. She's a well-respected uh, history professional in the consulting world. Um, and I have consulted her on some of my projects as a open space preserve manager. Kara is passionate about the history of the Chinese community in Napa. She's a historian, architectural historian who worked in historic preservation, who works in historic preservation and cultural resource management. She studied at UCLA and received her master's in public history from Sac State. She's lived in Napa County with her husband since 1996, with whom she's raised four beautiful daughters, all of whom attended local public schools. Kara is currently on the board of directors for Napa County Landmarks, the local historic preservation nonprofit. I'm super happy to introduce Kara Brunzel. Wow, thank you so much, Leslie and Katie. I wanna thank you for um, introducing, facilitating and thank the library and Rise Up Napa. Um, before I get into my talk, I just want to make a note that I did number the slides. So if anyone has a question on a specific slide, you can make note of it. And, and if time permitting, we can, we can return. Um, so here we go. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this works like a charm. Okay. So, um, the Chinese actually arrived in the Napa area about the same time as the earliest American settlers. Chinese immigrants were present at the foundation of Napa as an American town. Our first historian and a local journalist named C.A. Menifee describes a diverse population in 1848 when Napa was just being laid out. And he specifically talks about Native Americans, Black and white Americans from the East, and Australians all standing, quote, cheek by jowl with the Chinese in the tiny town. The story of Chinese immigrants in Napa is a really important part of our local history that has often been overlooked, in part because of language barriers, but I think also because some of the ugly elements of this story are things people would rather not remember. I was able in graduate school to perform primary source research in which I focused on stories in Napa newspapers that featured the local Chinese community in one way or another. And these, uh, these stories that I collected form the basis for the information I'm gonna share. Unfortunately, I don't read Chinese and we don't have any local documents from the Chinese perspective. So I need to point out that, you know, my sources were limited and from a single perspective. So hopefully some scholars will come along in the future that can um, bring more Chinese voices into this. So the, um, the background for Chinese immigration in the 19th century was uh, complex, similar to today, global migration was driven by both push and pull factors. The middle decades of the 19th century were a particular chaotic era in China. The British waged two opium wars against the Chinese and the Taiping Rebellion became a bloody extended civil war. This is an engraving that depicts an 1860 battle between Anglo-French forces and Chinese armies. And it just kind of demonstrates the, the bloodshed and chaos that was overtaking the homeland for many Chinese people. And, and to make matters worse, population growth meant that farmers had been forced onto ever smaller plots of land, making subsistence difficult. 
And the, the always precarious life of a Chinese peasant became um, intolerable and many fled China to avoid the war and poverty. California exerted pull on these migrants with its image as a land of riches. And especially after the gold rush began in 1849, the Chinese referred to California as Gold Mountain. Early Chinese immigrants to California were almost all male and young. These tended to be sojourners who hoped to make a fortune in mining or business and return to their families in China. And it was in fact quite common for the Chinese to make several trips back and forth despite the difficulty and expense during that era. The Chinese immigrants did a huge amount of the most difficult labor uh, in, in California and the US. They worked as farmhands, as cigar rollers, built roads, and of course railroads, and also worked in mining. Many were employed as domestic servants and cooks and typically would live with their employers. There were also a large number of Chinese entrepreneurs and small businessmen. One of the most common Chinese owned businesses was of course the laundry, but vegetable carts, grocery stores, general stores and small farms were also common. This engraving shows an imagined scene of a California harvest in 1878 and you can see Chinese and American or white workers, they might not have all been American, working together on, on, the, on the crush, crushing grapes by foot. Um, just a little aside, the local vintners were not happy that grapes were shown being crushed by foot. Even at that time, it was considered not particularly hygienic. These are some California photos. They're not from Napa County, showing the type of work the Chinese would do. You know, the photo on the left is a group of white and Chinese miners sluicing gold, and the, the lower right shows uh, the railroad being constructed. Over the 1850s, uh, a Chinese community began to form in Napa and uh, the city of Napa's Chinatown was located on a peninsula where the Napa River and Napa Creek came together, it was known as China Point. By 1860, the, the overall population of the city of Napa had grown to over 2,300. It had just been uh, under 200 a decade before. And census records show us that there were at least 14, quote, Asiatics in Napa. And I included this representative page of the census so you can see um, how we, we pull this information out of historical records. The red circle shows uh, three men from China. They are all between the ages of 21 and 30 and they all give their occupation as laundrymen. So they were all working in a laundry. And uh, a few other interesting things about this, this census page is that there doesn't seem to have been much of a Chinatown at this point yet, because these men are living in a boarding house with a bunch of other men who are white. You can see they're from Illinois, Idaho, uh, or Ohio, Ireland, various locations. And um, nothing is recorded about their race, so um, they can be assumed to be white. There are also very few women on this census page. Napa was a real frontier town in 1860 and there um, hadn't been much development in terms of churches and schools and the type of infrastructure that would encourage women to, uh, to move to a frontier town. Chinese entrepreneurs throughout Napa County advertised their businesses in local papers, including the Napa Register, the St. Helena Star, and some other papers that came and went over the years. 
These are ads from the 1870s and 1880s, and they show that in addition to laundries, local Chinese immigrants operated general stores and acted as labor contractors. Ginger, obviously an American nickname for a Chinese man, was among the most influential people in the St. Helena Chinese community. And uh, I'd like to also take note of the ad for the Sam Key Napa City Laundry on the upper left. We're going to come back to the story of Sam Key a little bit later. Here's a, a few more ads. Um, I just love the ones in the lower right with the um, special decorative font that I, I assume was supposed to look Chinese, uh, but it was really expensive uh, to have typeset at, at that time. So it must have been kind of a big deal to have that, to use that font. And you can see a China store in Rutherford, uh, which offered laundry, labor contracting, groceries, and Chinese goods all under one roof. And labor contractors offered wood chopping, grape picking, and general farm labor. As far as I know, there were no Chinese language newspapers, so um, Chinese would advertise by signs or word of mouth to their, uh, their patrons in their own community. And these English language ads are obviously targeted towards um, you know, English speaking Americans. We also know in terms of Chinese owned businesses that during this era, there were at least two farms within Napa city limits and a carp raising operation up in the hills somewhere. And we happen to know about these because there were newspaper stories about them. Here is an 1880 photo of a local grape harvest with Chinese and uh, white workers um, both working in the fields together. I apologize for the resolution, but I wanted to include it because uh, we just don't have many pictures of people actually working locally during that, um, that era. Other local industries that relied on Chinese labor included hop growing, quicksilver mines, uh, tanneries, and as many of you probably know, wine cave construction and excavation. Many of the Chinese immigrants that were here worked in remote parts of the valley, you know, where the, the farm fields and the mines were located. And so, so they were probably undercounted in the census. The census collectors, uh, recorders, probably couldn't get to every corner of Napa County. But by 1870, we know there were at least 143 Chinese in the city of Napa and the Chinatown was really forming. Uh, that community in the city of Napa grew by at least 100 over the following decade. And the photograph here on the right was taken by Napa photographer M.H. Strong. And it's a building and some, some men who live in Napa's Chinatown. Um, by the time the first slide map was, was created in 1886 for the Sanborn Insurance Company, that neighborhood had multiple dwellings, uh, at least one laundry and a Chinese temple. The St. Helena of Chinatown is pictured here on the left. And it was actually the largest Chinatown in Napa Valley, uh, probably because it was closer to agricultural and mining work. Leather tanning was one of the most important local industries for many decades. And of course, it was also one of the most dirty, smelly, toxic, and labor-intensive industries. Sawyer Tannery, which is on the east side of what is today Coombs Street, it's, it's still there, um, you know, adjacent to the river because tanneries were, they would just, uh, you know, dump their toxic waste into the river. So that's, they always located on the river. They were the largest manufacturer in the county by 1878. And this is an 1899 
portrait of Sawyer Tannery's workforce that shows a, a somewhat diverse workforce, although, you know, white men are in the majority. There are, there's at least one black man, at least two Chinese men, um, uh, perhaps a few Latinos, and there are a couple children, of course, which was fairly common at, at the time. At its peak, the San Leonard Chinatown had as many as 600 residents. So, and this was at a time when, you know, the, the population of San Lena overall was not large. So it was, a, it was a large percentage of the population up there. Um, this is a Sanborn map from 1899 showing Chinatown. You can see it's on the west side of the highway, um, south of Sulphur Springs, so that um, the empty area here, uh, north of town is where Gotts is today, and West Charter Oak is uh, in the general general location of these Chinatown buildings. And like the Chinatown in Napa, there are you know houses, um, what looks like probably a store, and at least one laundry. And here are some more images of St. Helena's Chinatown. The man on the right was a cook for the Lyman family. His name was Ah Hing. And he worked for them for 35 years. And officially, he was a cook, but he did all kinds of things, uh, including, you know, making the children in the family do their homework and um, many tasks for the family. And he went back to China in 1919 after his eyesight started to fail. The photo on the left is, um, was probably taken in, in, in St. Helena's Chinatown. Uh, we don't know, unfortunately, the, who the man is that's pictured, but it was taken in 1907. So here's where we get to the more difficult part of the story. The 19th century was an era of zero-sum politics. Um, many people believed that whites could not thrive if people of color were also doing well. And a strong and kind of nasty anti-Chinese movement arose nationwide. It was particularly enthusiastic in California where there were a large number of Chinese immigrants. These images are a sampling of the cartoons uh, with you know, very negative stereotyped depictions of the Chinese that were disseminated during this period through the national media. So this is the type of things, you know, local residents and other people would be seeing if they subscribe to, to national magazines. And in contrast, here are some actual images from the era of, um, of some men. Unfortunately, again, I don't know their um, but the young man on the left was photographed by the elite studio in St. Helena, so was probably a member of that community. And the two men on the right are um, pictured at the Tubbs Mansion in Calistoga. And so they, they're probably uh, employees of the Tubbs family. And it would be wonderful to find out more about them, but um, I, I don't know much right now. So here is some of the, the uh, things that were posted in the papers uh, relating to the anti-Chinese movement, it, which used pro-labor rhetoric as a justification for, uh, for its, uh, its desire to drive the Chinese out of, uh, of California and the US. The populist sentiment of the day held that Chinese immigrants hurt the economy because they were willing to work for lower wages than most white Americans and because they sent uh, a lot of their earnings home. In 1877, the Workingmen's Party of California was organized after 
anti-Chinese riots in San Francisco. And an Irish immigrant named Dennis Kearney was, was its leader. The group put forth candidates for the 1878 election and they actually elected one third of the representatives to the convention that would form California's new constitution. So it wasn't really a fringe group. It was fairly mainstream. And um, you have on the left here, uh, our Napa County ticket for this, um, this party and uh, whose main main plank was uh, the opposition to Chinese immigration and, you know, supposedly in the name of working men, but of course, a lot of the actual uh, candidates were, were wealthy and were not, were not working men themselves. So on the right, we have ads from businesses that promoted their services um, using this racist rhetoric of we're not going to employ Chinese and, and we have, you know, white employees. And they were, they were very explicit about um, how, you know, you, if you use their product, you would not be allowing the Chinese to stay um, and you would be, you know, you'd be helping get rid of the Chinese with the, with your boycott. Uh, this, this ad for this laundry, this is just one of many um, so-called white laundries that were started in Napa and elsewhere, elsewhere. And um, they, you know, advertise white labor only, and they typically quickly went out of business because they could not compete on price and probably on quality. And then there, we also have a white labor made shoes that, that are advertised in the, um, in, in the local newspapers here. So the, the negativity of the, the cartoons and the boycott rhetoric uh, can create an impression that it was total war between uh, white Americans and Chinese immigrants, but it was actually a much more socially nuanced sit situation. So there are many sympathetic pieces in local newspapers describing the Chinese with affection. Funerals and other ceremonies were sometimes attended by Americans and Chinese New Year was a particular object of fascination for white Americans. The traditional festivities with feastings, offerings, debt settling, gift giving, and the wearing of new clothes uh, were, you know, were participated in by the Chinese residents. And they would extend their gift giving to their white friends, to white policemen who would get, you know, free cigars from the Chinese community. And occasionally Americans attended elaborate Chinese New Year banquets and they would report on it in the register in great detail or in the St. Helena Star. And uh, one of the highlights, especially for the children in the community were the fireworks the Chinese would light. Uh, this provided an exciting diversion for American children, uh, you know, before, before the era of electronic media. And merchants in the Chinatowns competed to provide the grandest display and, and advertise that they would be doing so. So um, we don't have any early pictures of Chinese women, but they did start to join the men here eventually. Um, and, you know, families were formed. And this is a picture from Chinese New Year, 1896, which was February 19. And this is, I believe, the Chan family in front of the Taoist temple or Joss House as it was known to Americans. Um, the man standing in the background with all the children is uh, probably Wa Chuk Chan, who, uh, who was known locally as Wa Jack Chan. Um, I'm go going to talk at a little more length about the Chan family because we happen to have more information about them than, um, than many in this community. 
and they and because they were in Napa for an extremely long time. Uh, Wajak Chan came to the U.S. by 1876, according to census records, but he might have been here as early as 1860, uh, and he joined a brother who was already operating a store here, the Lai Hing Company and uh, began to work in the store and eventually took it over. So he was one of the earliest merchants in Napa, Chinatown. His son, Shuk Moi Chan, was born in Guangzhou about 1895. Uh, some accounts say that his parents had returned to China. Um, his, uh, Shuk Chan's mother, uh, Wa Jack Chan's wife, was actually uh, American citizen born in Weaverville, a Chinese American. And um, Shuk Chan came to the US as a toddler uh, before the turn of the century. And, and he was raised uh, as a Chinese American, uh, you know, fluent in both languages and both cu cultures. As a young man, he, he traveled throughout the U.S., worked at different jobs, and returned to Napa in 1922 when his father died to take over the family store. And in 1930, his family arranged a marriage for him with a Chinese woman named Li Kum, and he traveled to China and returned with her in 1931. And she actually was detained at Angel Island for some time, and he had to pay a bond to get her out. Also in 1930, the citizens of Napa uh, decided they wanted to improve the Napa River and create a yacht club where Chinatown was. And they convinced Chuck Chan and his mother, who was still um, helping operate the store and still alive and around and, and working in the store with him, they, con they convinced the Chan family to give up their home and the, the store uh, that was with their home. And they relocated their business to a different building on East First Street. And Chinatown had, um, you know, because of anti-Chinese activities and changes to the, the economy had dwindled down to, um, very few residents. Um, by some accounts, it was about 17, and most of them were members of the Chan family by this time. So uh, the altar from the uh, temple and the other contents of the temple were relocated to the new store. And it's very interesting reading the, the stories in the newspaper by, by this time, you know, 1930, the rhetoric had completely changed and, um, you know, there, the, uh, you don't see the hateful depictions or, you know, talking about trying to get rid of the Chinese. They, they talk about members of the Chinese family as leaders, Chinese pioneer merchants, and they call um, Shuk Chan's mother a, a venerable woman. So um, that's an interesting shift culturally. Uh, this is a holiday card that the Shuk Chan family sent out, a picture of Lee Kum Chan and their four children. I believe it was taken about 1940 based on the, um, the age of the children. And um, it's, uh, I, I love, I, I love it. I think it's such a, a fun image. Uh, and this is really the first image of a Chinese woman we have in, uh, in Napa. The Chan family, this is a, a portrait of Shuk Chan from the 1960s. And they, they moved to Placerville in the 50s and operated a Chinese restaurant there for several years. And they still own their store, which was by this time on um, East First. And when the city decided to extend Sosco Boulevard in the 1960s, um, the new location of the store was threatened and it was gonna be torn down. 
So the Chans in 1963 donated the altar from, from the original temple to the Chinese Historical Society in San Francisco. The booklets on the right were, um, were recovered from the store when it was demolished in 1965 and belonged to the Chan family. And the, the one in the middle, I don't know if you can, if it's big enough for people to read, but it was um, Lee Kum Chan's study book for her American citizenship test. And you can see where she filled in the, the county sheriff's name in English and, and names of the judges. And then she also wrote notes to herself in Chinese. So that's a really um, special artifact they have at the, the Napa County Historical Society. When the Chan family retired, they actually moved back to Napa, despite all the destruction of their, um, their business locations. And uh, Shuk, Shuk and Lee Kum Chan lived on Elm Street, right across the street from Shearer School. Shuck Chan was a member of E. Clampus Vitus. Um, many of you may be familiar, but for those who aren't, it's a sort of history and revelry club that is kind of a, um, a parody of the Masons and, and they, they create a lot of plaques and they're very popular in this year of Foothills. In 1979, E. Clampus Vitus sponsored Shuck Chan Day in Napa and the uh, Chinatown plaque was dedicated and I, there was a whole celebration and, and uh, I believe there was a parade and these buttons were given out, which are, there's a one of at the Historical Society, Napa County Historical Society. And I, I just love this button. It's, you know, it's, it's really big and it has these great pictures of the Lai Hing Company, the, um, the 1909 version and then um, the 19, 1930, uh, I think they are different buildings or maybe the building has just been altered, but um, it's a really fun artifact. And it makes me happy to see that Shuck Chan was recognized late in life. Oops, skipped a slide. Um, and here are some photos of the temple after, or the, not the temple, but the, you know, the altar from the temple after it was moved to the Chinese Historical Society. And I believe the photo on the lower right is Lee Kum and Shuk Chan, um, you know, giving offerings at a reconsecration ceremony um, at, in San Francisco. And the, the Chinese Historical Society still has the altar. So I, I really hope it someday will, will be displayed in Napa. I think that would be really neat for Napa County. So Ging Chan, their, their eldest son, was, became an accountant and worked at Mare Island and was involved with the restoration of the windship building at, uh, at First and Main uh, many years ago, and he and his wife Mary actually lived in Napa until their deaths. They both died last year, sadly. Um, I, I wanted to reach him for this presentation, but he's now passed. But the you know the Chan family has been associated with Napa for almost its entire history as a town. So I just have one more slide. I'm going to go back to Sam Key. I showed you that earlier ad for the 19th century laundry that was on Main Street. And I want to talk about this just a little bit because um, I work in historic preservation and, you know, we usually are dealing with buildings and this is really the only building we have left that um, has a direct association to the Chinese community. Um, so Sam Key was born in China about 1849 and opened his first laundry on Main Street in 1879. In a, I don't think in this building uh, because it housed other things at first, but nearby. And the location had 
housed a laundry for 12 years when he moved in and he, he operated for another eight years. And then in 1877, the Napa City Council passed an ordinance that declared that any laundry located on Main Street between First and Pearl was a nuisance. And they actually went and arrested Sam Key and his employees. Uh, but Key fought back in the courts and the, um, the district judge overturned the law and um, you know they had some pretty choice words for the Napa City Council and, and, and said, you know, you can't just say something's a nuisance to harass someone. Um, it has to actually be a nuisance and this is obviously just a, you know, a legitimate business and, and there's no reason for this. So he was, he was let out of jail. Um, and by the 1920s, he had moved into this building. And unfortunately, I don't really know when he went back to China or passed away, but I do know that by the middle decades of the 20th century, the Wong family had taken over this business. So it was still operated as a Chinese laundry all the way to 1980. And you can see that the, um, the Sam Key Laundry ad on the right is a much newer style of ad. Uh, and there's a long story in the Napa Register from 1979, and this, this photo in the middle is from that story. And it's a really neat story because it shows the, the Wong family, uh, including the kids, all helping and, you know, talks about how the kids are, are, you know, fluent English speakers. And the little girl in front is Lily Wong, and the photo's taken in 1979. And there is a wonderful narrative by her sister, Mei Wong, who is kind of hard to see. She's a baby in the background there. And she later wrote about growing up in Napa um, in the 70s and 80s as a Chinese American and about her experiences in the Sam Key Laundry, which uh, finally closed in 1980. Um, it, sounds like people had just, you know, most people had their own uh, washers and dryers by then, so they weren't patronizing the laundry, so they had to shut it down. So there's uh, much more information about the Chinese community, but I am going to cut this off, so, you know, I won't overwhelm everybody, but I will be available for a little while to answer questions if anybody has anything they would like to ask. And uh, thanks everybody for um, participating and uh, watching and listening. Thank you so much, Kara. Lil Lily at the last slide is just adorable with her big smile. I know, I know, I love it. Yeah, um, okay, so now we will move into our Q&A. Um, so feel free to enter any questions you have in the chat um, and I will read it off to Kara. Um, in the meantime, um, I, ha I do have a few already. Um, so let's see, let's just jump right into it. The first one, uh, let's see, do they teach local Napa history in school? Well, I'm not an educator. Um, I know that when my kids went to school, they did teach a little bit. I think they focused on Native Americans and um, as when I was in school, a big focus of local history was always the missions. Um, but I don't, I don't think they get into a lot of detail, but it would be really interesting to hear from, you know, some, the school district and some educators about that. Great, thank you. We're getting a lot of thank you. Thanks, Kara. Great job, Kara. That was a terrific program. Fabulous presentation. <laughs> um, let's see. And someone asked if this presentation was going to be available online. We are recording it. So um, it takes about a day or so, and then the library will upload it onto um, our YouTube page. So um, you can go on YouTube and just type in Napa Library, and you'll be able to find it. And then, you know, I'll be sharing it um, with Rise Up Napa. Um, so I'm sure there's multiple ways you'd be able to find it, but just let us know if you have any trouble. Um, so the answer is yes to that. Uh, let's see. So 
Oh, and in response to your last question, we had someone who said no, and that was from a 2019 graduate at NHS. So thank you for that from your personal experience. That's great. Um, someone else said third grade teachers in St. Helena do teach it. So that's great. Um, let's see. Such a long history of the Chinese in Napa. I had no idea of the continuity. Thank you so much, Kara. Amazing. And let's see. I have wondering when the tide turned to hate here or where the or were these types of anti-Asian stuff depicted on slide 14 and 15 always present when the Chinese were in Napa in the 1800s? It's kind of hard to tell because, you know, there's a lot of chaos in the very beginning, but it seems like it really, it was kind of, you know, humans are sort of have a propensity for prejudice and there was always some of that, but the, the organized movement was later and there's, you know, it, it ties in with the civil war and with, you know, race discussions and Republican versus Democrat, which at that time, you know, the Republicans were the anti-slavery party and the Democrats were more or less the pro-slavery party. And, um, you know, the Chinese, at, like early criticisms of Chinese labor called it slave labor and would criticize it on those grounds, which, which was usually an economic critique, not, not, not like a human rights, that most people that didn't want slavery didn't like it because they thought it lowered wages for white people. They weren't so worried about, you know, how enslaved people were treated. Um, but, you know, it, it does seem to have gotten worse in the 1870s and 1880s and sort of maybe then, you know, uh, it seems to have kind of subsided, but there were, you know, there a lot of things happened that I didn't even mention, you know, Chinatown burned down several times. Sometimes it was probably arson and, um, yeah, so it, it's very complicated, but I think it was worse during the last decades of the 19th century. Thank you. Um, let's see. So two, there's two parts to this, and some people are, are commenting with each other. That's great. Um, Leslie says, any thoughts about why the Chinese population dwindled in the 1900s? And then um, Lita mentioned, Leslie, I think the Chinese Exclusion Act played a big part of this dwindling of the Chinese in Napa and the rest of the country. Yeah, there were actually laws passed that, um, you know, said the Chinese could not immigrate here. And then at other times that men could come, but women couldn't come because they did not want people to form families. And then there were times when you know, people were technically allowed to come, but they would be detained for months or years at um, Angel Island. Uh, you know, there were different legal and extra legal methods taken. So that the, the anti-Chinese movement and Chinese exclusion laws are a huge part of it. Uh, but one part of it is also that, you know, many people came here intending to be sojourners. They did not want you know, the American dream. They wanted to make some money and go back to China. And so that that is certainly, um, I'm, I'm not trying to minimize the Chinese exclusion. That was a huge factor, but also people just by choice wanted to go back to China eventually. Yeah, and then Doug uh, made a comment. He said the Chinese Exclusion Act passed the U.S. Congress in 1882. Chinese women were excluded by an earlier act in the 1870s. And let's see. So Sue asks and says, thanks, Kara. You mentioned you have more stuff but wanted to stop for Q&A. Will there be a next chapter that you'll be presenting? Well, I am going to present through the uh, St. Helena Historical Society in September. I'm not sure if it will be, you know, a lot of new information or it'll mostly be this, uh, this presentation. I'll, I'll probably change some things up, but um, 
yeah, it takes a lot. It's a lot of work to kind of hone it down to, you know, the, the main points, but, but I would like to keep these efforts up. Um, Leslie and Michelle Herbs, who helped us, and I have talked about um, creating some kind of tour uh, showing, you know, the sites of Chinatown, and um, there are there are other efforts right now in um, St. Helena to plaque their Chinatown, the city council, um, Anna Chuteau, and some of the other um, you know, faith leaders in St. Helena are working on that. And I believe the St. Helena Historical Society. So that's kind of a related project, not so much an education project. And then, um, you know, I, I, that's another thing I think we should think about in Napa. I, I wonder why we don't have like a Chan Street, you know, because they were such a, a family that was here for, for so long. And, um, and they did a lot, you know. Yeah, great. Um, Leslie said, any thoughts on developing an exhibit at the Goodwin or Napa Library? There is so much information to share. Um, I mean, as someone who works for the Napa Library, yeah, I would love that. <laughs> uh, but I'm only one person, but um, my vote is in. Yeah, I mean, I've never really curated an exhibit, um, so I would need some help with that. Uh, but it is, it's definitely my dream to have the, um, the, the, the altar, you know, travel to Napa for a while and, and be exhibited here. And, um, you know, there, there are some other artifacts in both the historical societies. I think that would be wonderful to have an exhibit. Um, let's see, Phil has a great question. Do you know if Napa's Chinese community had social slash economic ties to others? For example, communities in San Francisco, Oakland, Lock and Maryville. They definitely did, especially the San Francisco Chinatown, which you know, like like today, was um, you know much larger and had services and and just a larger community. So yeah, people were people definitely had ties. There was a Sam Key Laundry in Santa Lena. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the same Sam Key because sometimes he's listed with a, a third name. Um, so it might have been another person, but de people definitely moved around. They had ties with other communities. Most uh, during the 19th century, most of the men that came here were, I believe there were six tongs, which were kind of like, um, you know, sometimes they're depicted as gangs, but they're more. Um, you know, they did sometimes get into criminal activities, but they, they provided, they were a lot like a, you know, um, lodges at that time. And um, I think they helped pay for people's passage and then you would have to, you would be a member, but they would, um, you know, so the, the tongs were in, um, you know, various places, uh, in the other communities. So there were, there were a lot of ties and a lot of moving around. All right, so let's see, Daryl asked, are there more Chinese historical landmarks than just the Moonbridge Park at First and Soskal? Um, I don't think so. I think that's all we have right now. But like I, I said a minute ago, maybe before that question was asked, our, um, the, uh, the Santa Elena City Council is working on getting getting a monument there and um, uh, or a plaque, but um, and there is I think there might be a plaque on the on the Sam Key Laundry Building because that is on the National Register of Historic Places, um, but I haven't I haven't checked for a while. I'm not sure if it specifically mentions the Chinese connection with its history. So so yeah, it's a the, the commemoration has been pretty ephemeral. There's not a lot. Um, going back to the Wong family, uh, someone asked, is that the same Wong family that owned the Chinese live food market at 1350 Maine? I don't know. That is a great question. I would love to do more research about the Wong family. Um, you know, the, the kids in that picture are you know, I think they're still around there, like in their 50s. So, um, and, and one of them was interested enough to write a whole narrative 
about her life. So it would be, um, I would love to find out about that, so. And I'm not sure, you might've answered this already. Um, has Kara been able to reach any members of the Wong family and are they still in town? They're not in town. I tried to find um, May Wong who wrote the um, narrative. Uh, I reached out to someone with that name on, um, on LinkedIn, but uh, May Wong is kind of a, um, a Jane Smith-ish name. You know, there's a lot of people with that name. So I couldn't really uh, figure out if it was the right person and, and she didn't respond. If, if I have more time, I would like to, because she, she wrote this narrative through the Chinese Historical Society in San Francisco. And so even though it's, it's over a decade old, but they may have contact information. So, so I would like to, I would love to connect with her because um, I, I do think she's still in Northern California somewhere. Um, let's see. My auntie Pearl was from Napa, as was I. Pearl may be her American name. I believe she met my uncle George in the 40s. Not sure where. Auntie was the personal secretary for Madame Shang Kai Shek. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. During the president's entire term. My uncle George traveled with them as an English interpreter. I would like to try and find out more about her family. I've lost contact with their son, Victor. It sounds like a fascinating family history. I, I wish I knew more about that, but I don't, I don't know anything about that particular family. But, um, you know, there, uh, there may be artifact, there may be things at the Napa County Historical Society or, you know, just the, um, the usual uh, census and uh, directories might, might yield some, some tidbits. Yeah, and it wouldn't hurt to, um, to, you know, uh, send, you know, send what you just wrote to maybe the library or call us um, because we could also check our newspaper archive. Um, you know, it, I don't know if we'll find something, but it never hurts to check. Ancestry.com actually is also, you know, you can do your ancestry research, but um, if you've lost touch with family members, you know, sometimes they're also doing research. So, and you can message people through Ancestry. So that's something to think about if you want to do family research. Yeah. The library also has something called familysearch.com that you get free with your library card. Um, so, you know, there's a few resources we could try to help you with. Um, so reach out to us for sure. Give us a call or email us and we'll, we'll see if we can find anything. And I think the, um, the Historical Society has, you, you know, you can go in there and do research, but I think you can also pay to have their volunteers research for you. So those are some suggestions. <laughs> Leslie. Oh my God, the library rocks. Okay, um, let's see. I think I think I'm seeing two more, which um, let's see, I think we'll have time to do. Kara, would you consider a second presentation since you mentioned having much more information but not enough time to share? Um, yes, I would consider it if there is interest, although there's not a lot more visual information. So it might get into, you know, like a school lecture zone because I I sort of used, I sort of shaped this around the, uh, the images I had and I used most of what's available, but um, yeah, I would, I would be, I would consider a second presentation. Um, all right, and any chance copies of photos of Lai Hing store would be available for us descendants now that it's no more? I, don't think there are, the only place I could find those photos was on that button. Um, they don't have them at the Historical Society. There, I, I actually went into the Napa Historical Society. I didn't just look on the online catalog and I didn't see them. I don't know, maybe um, the Chan family maybe somebody has some of those because that would be really wonderful. All right, so I, I don't think I'm missing any. I think I got them all. Um, 
And that concludes our Q&A portion. Uh, thank you everyone for all the really, really great questions and discussion. Um, now I'm gonna pass it back to Leslie who will talk about some action items and ways to help in your community. And I'm going to share my screen. Great, and thank you so much, Katie and Kara. That was awesome. Thank you so much. It's just such a fascinating hidden history, and it gives the whole Moongate context. So, so actions that you can take. Um, so, learn. So, thank you for being here. That's really a part of it. Uh, putting a human face on the Chinese experience, and also, of course, you can go to the library. I know that there is a whole display of books. Um, towards the front near the reference desk for AAPI Heritage Month. I've been reading Minor Feelings. It provides a really interesting context uh, um, in prose, although it's written by a poet of just kind of um, the Asian experience. Also, I really love Dion Lim on Twitter. It's Dion Lim TV. Uh, she is a journalist who's really devoted her career to just um, daylighting uh, hate against Asians. Uh, next, if you see something, say something. Encourage people to report. I guess I'll start reporting um, my, my experiences. Um, and also encourage folks that are victims to contact, especially if it's assault, contact the police if they're uncomfortable, contact their elected representatives. Um, also, uh, oh, I know another one is if you see racist taglines or um, inappropriate caricatures of Asians, tell the people who are putting that stuff out, which is something that I haven't done. For example, a lot of times the Chinese movement and the nutcracker is depicted in a very caricature type manner. And I think next time I see something like that, I'm gonna say something. Uh, also unite. So for example, you know, don't fight amongst ourselves. For example, um, the person who started, um, let's see, uh, uh, the group in Oakland that is escorting Asian elders to safely was started by a Latinx man. Um, also the Brown Berets, a Chicanx uh, group is actively helping the elders there. So we need to stay united in this effort. Uh, support, support Asian businesses when you can. For example, um, our Hunan Express restaurant at the outlet malls was run by a family, the husband passed on to the next world and so they could really use our support. Uh, donate, um, there's a number of organizations, uh, there's Stop AAPI Hate and they're the folks that are collecting data on Asian hate crimes. Uh, also, um, that if you just go to GoFundMe and enter AAPI, there's a number of groups. Of course, you know, you need to be buyer beware. I can't vouch for, for all the groups, but um, that's where Dion Lim TV on Twitter comes in. She's really good at posting um, GoFundMes for victims of hate crimes, folks that have been hospitalized, people that have lost um, their breadwinner to, due to hate crimes. So um, also engage. Uh, be civically engaged in your community. Uh, Napa dedicated China Point and um, the City Council of St. Helena is also gonna dedicate um, a plaque, some, some of their landmarks, so that's fantastic. Uh, ask our, are your electives what they're doing to increase resources for, for victims and um, what they're doing for race and equity uh, in, in our city and county government. Encourage and thank. So your elective, thank your elected officials when they do take actions to support, for example, anti-hate legislation. So thank Mike Thompson for supporting the recent anti-hate crime bill and um, work with your workplace or organization to issue statements denouncing anti-Asian and anti-Pacific Islander racism and really, um, and embracing diversity, equity and inclusion. I know a lot of workplaces are doing that right now. Um, and education. I know one of our Rise Up Napa members and other folks uh, here on this presentation have mentioned that it'd be really, really nice to have some sort of history of um, other people like the Chinese in Napa Valley. So these are just a few actions you can take. And um, also I do wanna mention my other Rise Up Napa partners who are on the chat. 
uh, Ermelita, Bruce Gullickson, Jen Simi, who started it all, and Michelle Erb. So thank you all for your support. We, we couldn't do this without uh, the team. So thanks, Katie. All right, thank you. Everyone is so nice in the chat. It was really, really great to see everyone's comments. I don't think I'm missing any questions. Hopefully not. Um, okay, well that concludes tonight's presentation. I really wanna thank Kara for sharing your research and your knowledge with us and Leslie for being here to represent Rise Up Napa and the great work that all of you do. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening and um, all the engagement, I really appreciate it. We hope you all stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you everyone. And thanks Katie and Leslie. Of course. Fantastic.